Hello, and welcome to Perspectives on Neurodiversity, a podcast dedicated to challenging myths and assumptions about neurodiverse life. I am your host, Christopher Scott Wyatt, speaking as the autistic me. Joining us for this episode is Elizabeth Bennett, author of the book, Courageous Conversations, a guide for parents to understand and connect with their teens. Ms. Bennett, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here, Chris. Well, let's begin with your background. You have 35 years of education experience as a school educator and principal. Could you tell us a little bit about that? It started relatively early. Actually, I was very excited about the possibility of being a teacher when I was in grade three because I liked the teachers that I had and they had an impact on me. And and then I just continued to choose that process, that, you know, going down that journey. It has been an absolutely delightful career. Certainly there have been ups and downs, but that's all part of the journey and the learning and and getting me to where I am today. So, you know, I've had lots of experience in terms of being in the classroom, teaching just about every subject there is from K right through to university. So, you know, it's been fun and exciting. And I thought it as I neared the end of my choice to retire from my school district, I wasn't done teaching and I wasn't done in that educational space. And so I created a a business so that I now have an opportunity to be able to coach families, coach parents, and coach sometimes teens or young folks, and be able to help them to have courageous conversations. And that's really why I wrote the book. Educators see the effects of what's going on at home. We see this as myself as a college and university instructor, I could see when there were stresses in the family life because it shows up in the classroom. The student seems distracted, angry, frustrated. So we see the home life. I think as a principal, you had to see this because teachers and other staff members would come to you when there were warning signs that something was going on. Right. We spend way more time with kids than they do usually at home, unless they're attached to, you know, a video game or a cell phone or whatever. But we can talk about that later. Teachers are compassionate and they understand what kids are going through because in most cases they either have their own or they've had their own experiences growing up in their own world. And so they have more of a chance to be able to connect with kids differently. Also, as I did as a teacher and an administrator, because there would be oftentimes, you know, where I would be sitting in the hallway and sitting with one student who was having a difficult time, or maybe a little group of kids who I was engaging with because there was a question or a problem or a concern or something to celebrate, you know, and I'd find something in our canteen, so yogurt tubes or something, because eating for me is a fun activity. So I would be sitting with them and listening to things that were going on for them. So saying things like, you know, my parents don't value me, or I don't have a voice at home, or all we do is yell and scream, or I don't have a chance to really be heard for what I would like to say or what I want to share. And then I would have, you know, from time to time, I would have parents who would come into my office and and they would be crying or annoyed or angry or upset or any number of those kinds of feelings and saying similar kinds of things. I don't know how to connect with my kid. I don't know what to say to them. You know, we seem to be separate. You know, we're so far away from each other. And all I want to do is to know and understand and find out what's going on with them. And so that's that's been the chasm that's been created. What I would like to do is to be able to break through that chasm or diminish it and bring kids and their parents closer together so that they can be connected with each other. Because the challenge that we have in the world at the moment and I have seen it and been part of it, is bullying is rampant, mental health concerns are through the roof, social isolation is on the increase, and now in North America, that includes Canada and the United States, suicide is the second cause of death of teens. Like, that shouldn't even be part of our conversation, Chris. You know, that's not, we shouldn't be having that conversation. Those numbers shouldn't be as big as they are. 
And I was in Hawaii just at Christmas time in the, the life and business section. The title of that was in Hawaii, it's the first cause of death of teens. Like that's so incredibly heartbreaking. And we need to be together in terms of educators, families, communities to be able to be that safety net and that security and that loving established relationship so that we can have that with our kids. This is a global situation. Yep. I have taught students from around the around the world. My cousin has taught in Hong Kong. She's currently teaching in North Africa. We see parents who work from eight in the morning until five or six at night. They're commuting, whether it's on you know train or car, it doesn't matter how they're getting to and from work. Their children are in school, depending on the country, from 160 to 220 days, depending on the culture and the length of the school day. Many of my students in South Korea were forced into tutoring by their parents. They put them in after-school tutoring. They put them in Saturday and Sunday schools to improve their test scores, to get into better U.S. universities. And while I was honored to have them as students here in the United States at a great university, they were burnt out. My students who were in Minnesota or Pittsburgh or in California, these are students who have been pushed by their parents to be a resume to be involved in every after-school sport. They are scheduled. They have tutoring, whether it's some of the names that come to mind, Princeton, SAT Review, Kaplan, Kumon, there's Mathnasium. There is an industry of test prep where everyone now is so concerned with SAT, ACT, college admissions, building resumes. You have to be a Boy Scout or Girl Scout, lacrosse, soccer, traveling, softball or baseball. What has happened globally to these parents where they're pushing their kids to basically be over-programmed and over-scheduled? There are so many layers to that. And I think one of them, and from my experience with parents that I've chatted with and seen similar to you, I think part of that happens to be their own, what might the word be, unfulfilled career or unfulfilled wishes for themselves. And then they want to put that on their children. And that could be, that could be in education, that could be in athletics, that could be in, in music or dance or anything that any topic that you can think of. And the unfortunate thing about that is that, and, and that's part of what we talked about before is the whole idea that they've never had a conversation with their kids in order to find out what their children want, because that's their life. And we need to be respectful of that too, even as teenagers, even as you know, young adults, even going into their twenties. You know, when we start asking kids at that age, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? There's a lifetime that they have to choose from, and they can be in anything that they want. But they're so busy being directed that it's it's so unfair, and the pressure filled space that they become in. That it's just in in some cases it's physically killing them, and mentally killing them, and emotionally killing them because they're so busy being in that box of expectation of somebody else's expectation. A family I know has their children in traveling baseball, in lots of sports activities, a lot of church activities. You name it, they're involved. They are scheduled every hour of every day, it seems. One of the parents made a comment to me, the only time I get to talk to my children is in the car going to and from sporting events or to and from church activities. And this strikes me. How do you work with these parents who the only time they see their children is when they're watching them at sports or watching them at a club or watching them at a school activity? They're not actually engaging with their child because they're another spectator Well, they're actually a spectator in their child's life. And isn't that a sad state of affairs? So how do we make this time to have these courageous conversations when these parents, they don't even have dinner with their kids. They're eating in the vehicle as they're going to the next scheduled activity. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a place where we have to look and see what's the balance in that. 
And where is it that the importance is about our children first and not about, you know, the external things? Oh, don't I look good because I have my kid in this or, you know, they're a star in this activity or that's so misplaced. There needs to be a place where we have conversation with families and say, take a step back and have some time to actually breathe because we don't do that very often. Busy seems to be the capital that we live with at the moment. We need to be able to do that because our children are not going to be there forever. We're not going to be in a space where we can celebrate them as loving human beings that are part of a world that we've created. And what we're doing at this moment in time is everything is external. Look there in soccer, or look there in dance, or look there in you know, and aren't we great because our children are in these activities and they're, you know, winning these awards and so on. That's great. But check in with your children to find out what's really going on with them. When they're busy in those activities, you're not having that conversation. When they're busy in the car, getting them to and from wherever it is you're taking them. Yeah, you might find five minutes in there. And yeah, you might, you know, you might be eating dinner in the car every time you're going someplace. But what's the need for that? Why is it necessary to have them in so many activities? How many families really have dinner together or have afternoons on a weekend together? Because when I think about it, my daughters are always commenting, we have dinner together. Like it's some sort of unusual thing. My friend is doing such and such. And it's like, yes, but at five o'clock in this household, we're having dinner together. Sundays, we are doing things together. That's become so rare. I think we need to ask ourselves, why have we stopped doing that? Why have we stopped family time? Yes, that is a very good question. And just recently, I had a conversation with a gentleman who is struggling with a drug addiction. And with that, you know, some issues with home and so on. And he told me clearly in his story that you know, he had amazing parents. They were in all kinds of activities. And, you know, he was doing all kinds of things. And now what he recognized was that he's lonely and he's alone because he didn't have that connection with them. He said, I, I have no idea really who they are. He said, as a kid, it was fun to be in those activities, but I never got connected to them. And they never got connected to me. And so I don't have, I don't have anything. And I feel empty inside and I feel alone and lonely. And, and that's why I got involved with, with drugs and alcohol, because it was a reduction of pain. The pain that I felt because I didn't, they didn't care enough about me. Yes, they gave me things. I had everything that, that anyone would ever want. And I was in activities and so on, but they weren't connected to me. And that's just one of so many stories. Without the family time that we have, we wouldn't have the casual conversations that open the doorway to the more complex conversations. Sitting down at dinner and saying, what did you learn in school today? What was your homework this week? How was your time at lunch? Who, you know, who are you eating with? What are you talking about? Now, girls being you know, preteen may say, oh, nothing. You have to rephrase the question then. Yep. What are you doing in math? Now there's not a nothing. <laughs> yeah. Now, now there's no nothing. Now there's, oh, well, we're working on fractions and decimals. Okay. But if you don't have those small conversations... The type of conversations that you might call a courageous conversation, how do you have that if you don't even have the foundational rapport with your child? And that's a very good question. And that's part of what I have conversations with when I'm coaching parents to say, this is an opportunity for you to find out more about what's going on. Do, you know, do you know anything about what's happening at school with your kids? Do you do you know anything about what's happening with their friends? Are they engaging in positive relationships or are they going down some rabbit holes and being attracted by things because they don't have that connection with you? 
gang affiliation is in the is on the increase in major cities everywhere because it's a form of family. It's a form of connection. And so kids can get engaged with that because it feels like somebody cares about them and not necessarily, you know, in obviously in the positive kind of way, but it's a connection that they're looking for because we don't live in this life in isolation. Our DNA is part of the the connection piece that we need. And so when we look at at families who aren't connecting, that piece of courageous conversation for me is about stepping out of your comfort zone and being vulnerable and saying, hey, I haven't seen you in a while, or you know, you're looking like you're you're a little bit upset or confused. I, I, if you've picked the wrong word, your kid will tell you, and it will be clear that that's not how they're feeling. So then you can engage in that part of the conversation. You can ask them more about, so tell me what's going on. We haven't talked in a while, or I you know, I just want to be able to connect with you. So let's have a, let's sit and have a conversation. Now, if it's something that where a, a parent would typically be in a space of yelling, because this is, this is part of what parents need to look at too, is their background and where they've come from and the kind of experiences that they've had. And they need to recognize that that shows up in front of them too. It doesn't go away because because they've grown up or they've gone to therapy or they've done whatever or ignored their background. But that shows up in their conversation when they see and when they, because those are filters that are built in that show up in how they show up with their families. So how they're being listened to, how they speak, how they see, and how they hear. And kids have them too. And so when Kids are just used to having parents yell at them or be so authoritarian in their relationship, then that's the way the kid's going to respond. So in that space of courage and stepping into that vulnerable space and being responsible for how you show up in that conversation, when you say, you know what, I noticed that, you know, we haven't had a good relationship or you know, I want to try something new. So I want to, to encourage you to be part of this and shift into a new space. Then that's where you can break through and begin to have those courageous conversations and welcome your child into the conversation. The title Courageous Conversations will imply to some parents the difficult conversations about uh, sexual activity, drugs and substance abuse, things like that. Yep. And they're all part of it. They're part of it, but they're not all of it. No. Can you explain what a courageous conversation is outside of just the assumption that this is going to be about sex and drugs? The whole idea about finding out what's going on for your children, the pressures that are ever present for kids are beyond what they have the skills and strategies to be able to deal with by themselves. So as an example, You know, my mother used to say to me, oh, don't worry about it. Just have a good day, honey. But she didn't she didn't know that I had just been approached to have somebody sell me drugs. I wouldn't go to the bathroom during the day at school because there were a bunch of bully girls in the bathroom. I was always the third of best friends. And so those things were hard for me, but I just dealt with them because she didn't know to ask anything any different. And she didn't, because she just didn't have, you know, as most folks, we only know what we know. And so sometimes it's going to be important to be able to just find out. Like, do you know your kid's favorite color? Or do you know what they like to eat the most? Or do you know what's going on with their friends? Or if they have friends? Do you know about, you know, just the the daily occurrences? Like what you mentioned before, who do you sit with? Do you have a good time when you're at school? Are there friends that you're engaged with? Did you notice somebody today who made you laugh? Or was there something that you saw that made you think? Or was there was there an incident in school where, you know, you saw a kid being bullied and did you step in to help? And why or why not? Or I just listened to a, a podcast on something. What do you think? 
you know, so that there's an engagement in the the global piece as well as things that are important for your child. And if you don't have conversation, then you don't know about them. You don't know about what makes them happy or sad. You don't know about what they're thinking about in terms of perhaps six or seven things that they want to do in their life moving forward. And what do you think about those? And so, you know, that's a place where I I talk about five strategies of dedicated listening. And I encourage parents to begin to have those conversations and be able to listen and understand where your child is coming from and move away the judgment of having, because we're typically as adults in, in education and as parents and so on, we always want to solve their problems for them. We just want to get in there and, you know, they say something and we've got an instant answer. Well, we need to put those answers on hold. And when we're having that conversation, we also need to be able to say to them, what are you looking for when we have this conversation? Do you want me to help you solve the problem? Do you want me to walk alongside so that we can do something together to find an answer to it? Or do you just want to vent? Because sometimes that's just what we need to. But I think we forget about the whole idea that we need to be connected as families to go out and be outlandish and have some fun and do stuff together and not simply just push them away and say, oh, well, they need to be in those activities. Really? Do they? When children don't have the connection at home, as you've said, they will find it elsewhere. Yes. As a teacher, you see it even at the university level. You'll see them get into small groups, cliques, whatever you want to call it, that are often negative influences on their lives because they're looking for that sense of purpose, that sense of belonging, that substitute family that they didn't have at home. If your your child's already a teenager and already seeking out people to fill in that role, how do you go step back and rebuild what should have been a family connection? You need to be honest with yourself and you need to take a look first over here with you and say, okay, what's my responsibility in this? How did I show up? What's missing? And what can I do right now to make it different? Because that's part of what we need to do. We need to be responsible for our role in how things are working. And if they haven't been working well, then we need to start anew. And being able to do that requires being courageous. It requires stepping out of our own comfort zone. It requires looking at how we've been, taking on that responsibility, and then being able to say to our kids, hey, you know what? I feel like something is missing. And I feel like we're losing our connection with each other. And I'm delighted that you enjoy doing those kinds of things. But I want to be able to have a connection with you. I want to be able to know and understand and maybe help if I need to, or if you want me to, and being able to reconnect and being honest with, okay, you know, I didn't do it right, or I've let it go, or what. There needs to be some taking on that ownership and responsibility first. As parents, caregivers, teachers, we need to remember, first and foremost, we are the adult. Yes. And when I hear someone say, well, my child doesn't talk to me. <laughs> Okay, but you're the parent. You can say, let's sit down and I'll sit here and tell you, tell me how your day was. I will sit here and ask you again, what little things did you do today? What do you want to do? Are you enjoying these activities? Are you enjoying your classes? Are there any problems? We have to be willing to ask questions and then to sit until they answer. As a teacher, I can tell you there is nothing that intimidates a class more than silence as you wait for somebody to answer. And a lot of teachers can't do that. They'll just jump in and say, oh, well, you know, the answer is this and let's move on. The real skilled teachers are the ones who can tolerate five or six or even 10 seconds of absolute silence waiting for somebody to raise a hand and give an answer. As a parent, you need to do that too. Yes. You're the adult, lead the conversation. Yep. And when you talk to these parents who are struggling with these conversations, many of of my listeners, my audience, we deal with neurodiversity. So we're talking about children with ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, P 
PTSD, learning disabilities, they have differences that are already a challenge that already cause them stress. Yep. These are children who may have been in foster care or may be in kinship care because sadly, students with special needs often come from pretty complex backgrounds. So they've had these adverse situations in their lives. Our daughters were foster to adopt. So for four years, they were our foster daughters before it became official and they were adopted. These traumas that they go through, we all know that trauma shapes the brain. Trauma changes the brain. That makes it even more essential for parents of children like many in our audience to be even more patient and to be even more willing to sit there while the child comes up with what they need to say. Trauma is not easy to express. So how do you go about helping someone else who's a teenager, a pre-teenager, say, I'm being bullied, I have been sexually approached, or I have seen friends doing drugs? How do you reach that point where they can say those things? And they have to express them. You can't, you can't keep it bottled up inside or it becomes another type of problem. For a parent who might be having a challenge with that kind of conversation, they can put it outside of themselves a bit and say, you know what, I was talking with a friend, an adult friend or a parent friend, and this is what I heard was going on with them. So that you're you're providing the shape of the conversation that you're going to have, and it's away from you so that the child doesn't feel like you're going to nag or you're going to be the interrogator or you're going to, because that doesn't work either, right? And we know most kids, and it doesn't matter whether they have a, a challenge or not, and even as adults, we don't like it either when we have directed type questions because that sets us back and it's usually a trigger. So if a parent could come up with a scenario and say, you know what, I was talking with Jane the other day, or I was talking with Mrs. Perez, and you know, I in our conversation, she said she was having some challenges with her child you know, based on whatever, or that, you know, she had been approached by somebody, or she's been sexually abused. You can create that story so that you can bring it forward and then be able to invite your child into having that conversation with you. You know, what do you think with that parent and that child? How do you think we might be able to have that conversation? Would that be something that you would feel that you could share? You know, if that kind of thing happened to you, would you feel safe enough to be able to come home and, and speak with mom and dad about it? You know, if there was a bullying situation, how would you be able to help somebody if you saw that happening to them so that you're you're not directing it right at your child at the moment, but being able to provide an opportunity or a, a scenario, a picture of something so that you can work through it together? Much of the anger my wife and I see in our children and the anger and frustrations that we see in other children who are similar comes from academic performance. Yep. Learning disabilities like dyslexia, dysgraphia, other challenges like ADHD, when they affect the academic performance, the child gets frustrated. And young people who are struggling don't always have the words to say what is frustrating them, so they act out. Behavior is a form of communication. Your child being angry at home, frustrated, saying, I don't want to talk about school or I don't want to talk about that teacher, that to me is a sign usually you need to sit down and say, okay, why don't you want to talk about school? So a lot of the anger that we see at home can start those hours that we don't see the kid because the, the child's at school most of the time. Right. I think it's important to Remember as a parent that your child acting out is that child, that undeveloped, un immature brain trying to communicate in the only way a child might know how to communicate with an attitude and some anger. Right. And part of that happen has a space in our education system too. It's very frustrating from the standpoint of the piece about SATs or, you know, any kind of testing instrument that's going to be used within the system. That instrument, for the purposes of this example, is a square. Our children are not all squares. They're triangles, they're circles, they're 
you know, they're flowers, they're any number of things. And any of those other shapes don't fit into that square. And so we need to be doing something globally in order to assist and recognize where our children are. The frustrations that occur in a classroom are a lot around not being able to have kids see or do or act or or describe something in a particular way. So we need to find a different way for them to be able to express it so that they feel like they have some form of success. So as an example, you know, we were talking about uh, doing a project or writing a, a, a paper on bees and, and their production and so on. Why does it need to be a paper? Why does it need to be written down? Perhaps your child or or another child for this example, you know, maybe they can sing a song about it. Maybe they can draw a whole complex story around, you know, the product that here's how a bee does the whole production and how honey is made. It shouldn't be that we expect everybody to write down on paper exactly what's going on. Somebody else might be able to to do a song and dance around it or a theatrical composition or create a poster. They shouldn't be prevented from demonstrating how they can understand or how they can share. That's what really blows my mind and makes me so angry about what our system looks like. And it doesn't matter whether it's United States, whether it's Canada, whether it's anywhere in the world. We're so focused on having kids meet these expectations that in most cases are not accurate for anything that they're going to do when they move forward. Your child might be a perfect entrepreneur and doesn't need or doesn't have to be in a university environment because they might be able to, they see the the ability that they have or you encourage that ability for them to be able to be incredibly successful as an entrepreneur. And what's the matter with that? Or you, your child might be interested in, in the trades. And what's the matter with that? We're so focused on that. And what ends up happening is that focus and that weight is put on our children. And then they, they can't see, they don't have the strategies and the skills yet in their developmental time to be able to purposefully acknowledge or tell you about how they're feeling or so on. Because those emotions and those feelings and that anger and frustration and love and desire and, and everything else that goes in, that, that fits in their brain, as adults, we can pretty well manage it because we have experience and we have age and we have some sort of intellect in there where we can manage. But kids don't have that yet. And their brains aren't developing at the same age as their age. It takes them a lot longer. Their brains function and their, their development is ex- that development is extended beyond where we imagine that they are. It frustrates me that the thing that kids need most, in my humble opinion, is the thing that we can't test and so we don't teach it or we shortchange it. That, that's the arts. You can test English grammar rules. You can test math knowledge on a computer. You can test recall of facts about social studies. And even as a teacher, when I went to get my credential here in Texas or in Pennsylvania, you sit down at a computer and you take the national teacher exams, the NTE or the Praxis, or here in Texas, what's called the TEXES, the Texas exams. They're all basically administered by one or two test companies. They're on a computer screen. There is no way to be truly creative. There's no way to do anything different. It's just multiple choice or fill in the blank. So even as adults, we test our teachers in the same way that we tell them is probably not the best way to teach. (laughs) It breaks my heart, though, that we can't, because we can't test music and art, we can't really test writing. I don't care what anyone says. You can't really test creative writing and poetry. So what happens is we teach these things that can be tested. We focus on them. And so a child who does want to draw a picture or put on a a play or sing a song, 
well, gee, you know, the state exam on bees is on this computer and you've got to sit down at this screen and click the yes, no boxes to take this test on bees. I'm sitting here thinking about the school system and post COVID, I thought, yay, the children are going to go have a teacher. But when my daughters were coming home, they're like, well, yeah, then we go into the computer lab to take the tests. Well, that means the tests are point and click. How do we expect children to mature, to find themselves, to grow, to communicate if the very things that help us communicate as humans, art, music, song, speaking, public speaking, we, we don't teach those because, well, gee, there's no test for those. How do we help our children develop? We have to do it at home then. Well, I would hope that there would be something in the curriculum that provides an opportunity for students to understand about collaboration. And so in the classroom, hopefully there are opportunities to collaborate on a project. We need to be in a space where we go to where the students are and their capabilities and their space and learn to understand how each of them learns. Because as we know, there are multiple intelligences and not everybody functions the same way. I'm very visual. I like to see things. I like for you to demonstrate something. I like to see the pictures of it. You know, though somebody else might be an auditory learner, somebody else might be a kinesthetic learner where they need to be moving and they need to do that. And we need to be able to incorporate all of those different types of learnings, different types of intelligences so that they are merged into how students learn. We can no longer be in the space where everybody sits in a straight row, everybody sits and they're quiet and the teacher is the the leader or the purveyor of information and it's simply just dumped on students and they need to hear it and, and memorize it and so on. We no longer live in that space. And so we need to be able to provide kids with opportunities so that they can match up what's possible for them in the real world. I think there's a flip side to that too, is that I grew up in the 70s and 80s. You would go to school. Yes, we had straight rows. We got the lesson. We went home, but we went home and played outside and we had our weekends free. And so it was a different balance. We could be free at home to you know, play in the dirt, ride our bikes, paint, draw, read, whatever we wanted to do. Now that we are in this hyper-scheduled parenting approach, there isn't that artistic freedom, that individual playtime that, that is part of learning. Yep. And that's the missing link. Let's talk a little bit about your book specifically. You mentioned that you have structured this around some ideas on being an active listener. Yes. As I've said, parents, because we have all this going on at school, school is becoming this hyper-stressful. And then the kids come home to yet more programming, yet more rigidity, this freedom to express themselves and this ability to be heard. They're never heard. Now, what are your some of your guidelines here for active listening that we need to start doing as as parents and as a as cultures around the around the world that have rigid schools now and rigid after school? Yeah, it's a frightening kind of space that we're living in at the moment. So, you know, I have five strategies for dedicated listening. And the first one, and they're not in any particular order, however, they all have their importance and they flow into each other. So the first one that I typically have conversation around with parents is understanding versus judgment. So again, that needs to be where you're trying to understand where your child is and what's going on for them, and what kinds of activities are they in, and what does it look like at school, and how is it with their friends, and so on. And some of those could be open-ended questions or extensions to, so expansion of a conversation. So you might say something like, so tell me a little bit more about that. When you said this to me, tell me a little bit more so that I understand it. And we're moving the judgment piece away. So we're not coming up with a solution right away. We're not already thinking about what we're going to say next, because we do that. That's a typical kind of response, right? We're already thinking about what we're going to say, and we're not really listening. A second one that I use is called intentional time. And you mentioned something before about being in your car. And 
you know, some parents have mentioned to me that this seems to be a, a some somewhat of a good thing to be in the car together with your child and not necessarily at the expense of, you know, just racing to the supermarket or or getting to the next game, but a space where you can have intentional time. So that means it needs to go on your calendar. It needs to be something that's purposeful and that you take that time. And again, here's another piece to it is that it has to be intentional time with one child at a time. And it doesn't mean hours and hours. However, it needs to be time that you're just sharing and finding out what's going on and and enjoying each other's company in that time. And if that means, you know, for the first couple of times, because if you try it and it's something new that you're doing, yes, there's going to be those pregnant pauses or that time where there's going to be silence. And you know what? You need to suck it up as the adult and just be with it. But it could be something where you start a conversation by saying, hey, you know, I just listened to this podcast and, you know, this is a current event. Or what do you think about what's going on in the world? Let's look at our own government or let's look at what's happening in in Russia or let's look at, at what's happening some other place. What do you think about it? And if you were the leader of the world, what would you do differently? Or what would you what would you do the same? Or, you know, like just to, to start having conversations so that you get a chance to hear their perspective. And what's the matter with that? What's what's the matter with with allowing your child to have a perspective? And even if it's not the same perspective as yours, what's the big deal in that? It gives them a chance to be heard, to be valued for their conversation. That intentional time is really important. Another piece of it is, whether it's the third one or not, but it really is about understanding first and then speaking. So you want to, and if you're having a conversation or your child comes home and they're frustrated with school or so on, and you might say to them, okay, so what would you like my role to be? What would you like mom or dad to, to do in this particular situation? Do you want us to help you solve the problem? Or am I just going to be a listener for today? Or can I give you maybe a couple of different perspectives on, you know, after you tell me what's going on, just so I know. So then there's that space of connectedness. There's that space of listening. There's that space of understanding. A place where, and this is a delicate spot too, you want to use some of their words in your response. So when you said this to me, what did you mean by that? So that I understand a bit more, right? So that you're really engaging and that way they know that they're being heard. And not so much you need to be careful about the therapist piece, but just the whole space of, so when you said you were sad about your friend not sitting with you, what did that mean and what would you like to do about it? Or do you need some support in terms of maybe having a conversation with, with your friend tomorrow and, and asking them, right? So that you're, you're providing a little bit of teaching in there. You're providing a little bit of comfort and support. There's some safety going on with that. And then the, the last one is about finding flow and allowing your child to moderate and move through the conversation and allowing them the space to be able to guide the conversation with whatever is important to them too and not you know necessarily shutting it down or because there's a space in there and if parents want to learn more about this they can visit courageousnetwork.com yes you are doing this consulting as elizabeth bennett group yes and you are available to talk to parents and help coach them through this process I certainly am. And my book is available there. There's an opportunity for folks to sign up to book a call with me if they'd like some more conversation or if they'd like to engage in a coaching program. And there's also a space that they can click on as well um, because I have a free gift for your listeners. And that's all on the website. And if they want to schedule something like, say, a Zoom group where you would talk to a, a small group of parents or educators. Is that something you do as well? Yes. 
How has the pandemic, do you think, changed this dynamic where a lot of kids were home yep, and the parents were home working? Why didn't more communication happen? And we can look in that from both sides. So I know that I know families who cherish that opportunity to be together. So it gave them more uh, chances to sit down and have meals together, to play games, to have conversation, to you know, do things in their home that that made their home a place of safety and security and fun and excitement, even through that challenging time. So they would, you know, paint or they would do crafts or they would bake together or cook or create different kinds of things and be able to feel that they had their parents' support in terms of the expansion of their knowledge in school because it was a challenging space. Then we look over here on the other side of the spectrum, and some of those situations for some of those children could have cost them their lives because they were in spaces and places where there might have been abuse or alcoholism or any other number of tragic things that were happening in homes, and then kids didn't have an escape from that. And so that created... Uh, way more pressure, unrecognized, and the inability to be able to share some of that frustration or that fear or that anxiety. or And that's partly what created some of the mental health concerns. And as an extension to that, that's why some, pe- that's why some kids get into drugs and alcohol, or they get into cutting, or they just take their lives because the pressure is too great. It's interesting to reflect on the different parental dynamics and even during COVID when suddenly you weren't at school, you weren't doing all the activities, that for some families it wasn't a better time. No, no, definitely not. I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast for this hour. Again, this is Perspectives on Neurodiversity, and I really want to thank having the perspective of Elizabeth Bennett, 35 years in education, now a coach and author of Courageous Conversations, A Guide for Parents to Understand and Connect with Their Teens. Thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thanks, Christopher. It was delightful to have that conversation with you today. 